Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, our Good Friday worship service this evening. I'm glad you're able to join us on, on Facebook Live, on our um, TUMC Facebook Live, or Facebook page, rather. It's good to have you all with us, um, whether you are a lifelong member of Trinity or um, never ever been to the church before and you're just checking things out. It is great to have you with us as we, um, as we remember and as we reflect and we tune our minds and our hearts to what Jesus did for us on the cross. And that is my prayer for tonight as we get started, that there are just so many distractions right now, <laughs> so many distractions personally for me and for all of us with everything going on, different schedules, different everything. And my prayer, and hopefully you will join me in prayer, that all of that would fade so that we can focus on Jesus' love for us tonight. And we can remember and we can know and we can confidently and boldly proclaim um, that Jesus gave up everything for us, that we know that he loves us, that we know that he loves us so much because of what he did on the cross. And we're going to do um, several scripture readings tonight, and I want to thank those in advance who helped out with that. Uh, we have some people doing it on video, as well as Pastor Justin and I doing some readings. We also have some worship, but um, as we head into worship and head into our first scripture reading, let's, let's pray together, um, you from your homes and, and me from the church, but... Uh, Lord God, we welcome you to be present in our time of worship tonight. That while things are different, it doesn't take it away from the power of your spirit and your ability to unify the church. Um, and like I said, Lord, my, my prayer is that all of the peripheral distractions and things fade away. That um, you may show up powerfully and to uh, just grasp our hearts, grasp our minds and keep us um, focused on the cross tonight, focused on what you have done for us so that it might shape us and change us and let us know of the freedom that you offer us, that you have paid the price for our sins and that should lead toward a changed life. And so Lord, I, 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 we give ourselves to you in worship tonight and I pray that you are glorified by it. So Lord, thank you for being with us in our homes. Thank you for being with us as we gather around TVs and tablets and all of these things and do things differently. I thank you that you are unchanging. That the truth of your sacrifice and your resurrection will never change. And so Lord, thank you for being with us and guide us in worship tonight and we pray that you are honored by it. In all things we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. Our first scripture reading tonight is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, and it's shared with us uh, by John Davis. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me? Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples, and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Hey, church family. I know that worship online is a little different. And it's still hard to feel comfortable worshiping in our homes. We had a cool time of worship last night, and I was in my basement. So, 
pray that you guys would just reflect today. One can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Teaching, and you did not arrest me. 
but this has all taken place that the writing of the prophets might be fulfilled then all the disciples deserted him and fled Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing law. The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross My sin upon His shoulders Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and the resurrection why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom But this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid our ransom. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, 
Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. I'm going to continue our reading um, in Matthew chapter 27. This is Jesus before Pilate. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor. And the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You've said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony that they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even a single charge, to a single charge, to, to the great amazement of the governor. Now, it was the governor's custom at this festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. And at the time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. So while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message, don't have anything to do with this innocent man. I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which one of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. Uh, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They, they all answered, crucify him. Why? What, what crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. And then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. I'd like to spend a minute uh, leading us through a prayer. And um, before I do, I just need a minute. Um, I need a minute to focus on my Savior and not on everything else. Again, I thank all the scripture readers tonight. Uh, thank you for helping out and for getting that set up for us. I really, really do appreciate you helping us um, lead worship. And let's, um, let's pray together. We stand near the cross, O oh God, disturbed, distraught, and discouraged. Yet we gather as disciples, those whom Jesus loves, in the face of such suffering, show us the face of our Savior. In the shadow of such evil, show us the light of your grace. On this day of remembrance, let us stand as witnesses to your great love for all the world, revealed in the outstretched arms of Jesus Christ our Lord. It is in the name of Christ that we cry out to you for the suffering of the world. So Lord, we pray for your church, for the church both near and far, that we may always be on the side of the oppressed and not on the side of the oppressors. We pray for the gift of faith, that we may put our trust in you, even in times of suffering and of difficulty. We pray for those who are suffering now, that they may feel your presence with them. We pray for those who care for the sick and hospitalized. Lord, we ask that you strengthen them in their service. We pray for those who mourn, that they might feel your comfort as they kneel 
at the foot of the cross. Lord, we pray for all those who are wrestling with issues of faith right now, struggling to know whether or not you are with them. We ask that your face would not be hidden from them. We pray for all of the families and all of the nations of this world that they shall remember and turn toward you to find their peace. Lord, all of this we pray in the name of our great high priest, Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our final scripture reading for uh, tonight is from Matthew 27. I'll be reading verses 27 through 50. It says, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And in the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until about three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma shabbathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing, standing by heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for it. always had a hard time with the name Good Friday, right, and, and Holy Week, and uh, there's some, some really good stuff out there that makes it very simple, um, but the next song we're singing is also a similar, how is it, how is it wonderful, and without it, we'd be lost, right, that's the wonder of it, that's the goodness of today. Serve 
Thank you, Justin, as always, for leading us in worship. Appreciate that. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thanks for your patience as well. If any technical issues might come, sometimes we're on top of it. Sometimes it takes, <coughs> it takes a minute. Excuse me. <coughs> um, 
In my office, I have, I have several different crosses that hold a special meaning for me. I'm going to show you a couple of them. This one is a, a letter opener that at the top, it might be, might be tough to see, but at the very top, there's a Celtic cross. And this is special to me because um, my grandfather left this to me when he passed away. And so whenever I see it, whenever I use it, I'm reminded, reminded of him and reminded of um, his commitment to faith that he always modeled for me. So this is a very special, beautiful cross for me that I see every day in my office. Another cross that I have in my office is, is this one. This is a, a palm branch cross that my kids made for me, I think, like two years ago. And... Um, when I see this, I'm obviously reminded of Jesus' sacrifice, but I'm also reminded of my responsibility to raise my kids in the faith, to raise my kids to know and love Christ like my parents did for me. And so this holds a, another special meaning, another, another beautiful cross that I keep in my office. And if you come into my office, you'll see, you know, there's other crosses that I keep on the wall that are, you know, <laughs> intricate and, and artistic and decorative. And they're meaningful to me in different ways. These, these beautiful crosses that I have in my office. Maybe some of you have crosses in your house that are, that are similarly artistic and similarly meaningful to you. Or maybe they were uh, a, a gift to you. Maybe um, you just picked it up at a store or whatever just because you just really like the way it looks. Or maybe it reminds you of a certain scripture passage or a certain time in your life. But you have, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of you have these you know, decorative crosses in your homes that are meaningful to you in different ways. A lot of us have decorative jewelry that are crosses around our necks, in our, <laughs> on our earrings or whatever we have. We wear the cross as this, this symbol of, of what Christ has done for us, but also it, it's a beautiful representation of that. It is a beautiful cross. When we were doing the renovation project in the fellowship hall that I'm standing in now, um, Honestly, to me, it didn't feel complete until we put up the cross. Until that was, you know, that was painted and, and gotten ready and, and, and put up. It wasn't, the room didn't feel right. It felt off. It didn't feel like a worship space until we had a beautiful cross front and center for everybody to see. And if you come to our church, you'll see that lots of different places in our sanctuary and in our halls and all, sort, all over the place, we have sometimes beautiful, shiny, ornate crosses that are meaningful to us. And so a lot of times, you know, we, we represent the cross. We represent the cross kind of like this. That is, it is, it's kind of a silly maybe example, but it's, you know, sparkly and decorative and meant to be something beautiful. Meant to get us to be thinking about, about beauty and, and things that are like aesthetically pleasing to us. But as we read tonight through the story of Jesus' arrest and crucifixion in the Gospel of Matthew, for Jesus, this was a time that was anything but beautiful. For Jesus, these hours were the furthest possible thing from beauty that he could ever experience. And over and over again in this story, we read these different segments in the story, in the story of what he went through. And it's just torment after torment in different ways. Now we first read of Jesus praying in the garden. And to me, this is one of the most powerful scenes in Scripture where he is begging his closest friends and his most devoted followers, be by my side. Be with me for just a few hours. I need you here. Stay with me. But they fell asleep. They couldn't stay awake with Jesus. And so they left him to, to suffer by himself. To just pour out his tears and these prayers of anguish alone. And so Jesus went to the cross full of sorrow. The next we read of Jesus being betrayed by Judas. Judas. This man that Jesus has walked with for years and ministered to and taught and loved and trained and equipped. He loved Judas. And now he's being sold out by this man for a couple pieces of silver. 
And as Jesus was taken away by, by Judas and by, by the Jewish authorities, the disciples deserted him. They got scared and they ran. Suddenly they were awake, awake enough to run away. And so Jesus went to the cross abandoned. Jesus was then brought to the religious ruling council called the Sanhedrin, where he was falsely accused of blasphemy, where he was spit on, where he was beaten. And it was at that same time where the Apostle Peter was close by, pretending he didn't even know that Jesus existed, pretending that he never met Jesus. And so Jesus walked to the cross insulted and disowned. Next, Jesus was brought to the Roman governor of the region, a guy named Pilate. And instead of releasing Jesus after finding no fault with him, finding him totally innocent, instead of releasing him, Pilate bends to the will of the crowd, shouting, crucify him, crucify him. So Pilate sent Jesus to the cross, beaten and despised. Finally, we read of the Roman soldiers seizing Jesus and bringing him to the cross. And they dressed his broken body up to to look like a regal king sitting on a throne with a robe and a scepter. They fitted a crown of thorns and jammed it on his head. And they mocked him. He was then nailed by his hands and his feet to a wooden cross between two criminals. And he hung there for hours until he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus died on that terrible cross, mocked and tormented and alone. So Jesus' experience with the cross was this horrific, lonely, violent experience. But for us, but for us, we think of the cross as something beautiful. And this isn't meant to be a guilt trip because it is. Because for us, it is something beautiful. For us, the cross is wondrous. For us, the cross is wonderful because it is a reminder that God gave up everything out of his love for us. That the Son of God went through unthinkable torment so that we would never have to. So that our sins would be washed clean by his blood that he would spill. He would allow to be spilled for us. And so now the cross for us decorates our homes and decorates ourselves and our churches and everywhere around us as something beautiful because to us it represents the most beautiful thing in the world. It represents God's love. It's important that we remember that at no point in our reading, and no point in anywhere in the Gospels was Jesus forced to the cross. But he willingly went to the cross out of his great love for us. Willingly walked those steps. Willingly was abandoned. Willingly was beaten was beaten and mocked and nailed to the cross. Jesus told his disciples earlier on in the Gospels over and over and over again, he told them that in a few weeks that this would happen. That I will be killed. That this is going to happen. And they most often refused to even believe him. Refused to acknowledge it as a reality. When he was being arrested, he told Peter that if he wanted to, he could snap his fingers and call on an army of angels down from heaven to wipe out everyone who stood in his way. He could have done that. It could have been over. But he didn't. Because Jesus understood his mission. He understood why he came, why he became incarnate for us. He understood that he was the fulfillment of of a prophecy from Isaiah 53 that was written written 700 years before he was even born. In Isaiah 53, it says this. It says, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with, with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we didn't care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles, were, his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, 
crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on Him the sins of us all. Earlier on in Jesus' ministry, He was teaching the disciples about servanthood because they were not getting it. And so in Matthew 20, verse 28, He told the disciples that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to also give his life as a ransom for many. He didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And so this cross that we reflect on today, on this Good Friday, was was a terrible, old, rugged cross that we sometimes sing about. Because for us, Jesus went through the unthinkable, But the cross is also a wondrous cross. It is a wonderful cross because for us it represents the beauty of God's love in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. It is because of the sacrificial love of Christ that we are set free from our sin, given freedom from death. In 1 Peter 2.24 it says this, that He Himself bore our sins He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So it is as a loved, it is as a forgiven and a healed people that we are welcome to the table of grace tonight. We partake together in the bread and the cup of communion as a means of experiencing the grace and the presence of Christ. Christ crucified and Christ risen and victorious. Hopefully you had time to prepare some communion elements for your family at home. We tried to communicate that. and If you haven't, now would be a good time to scramble over to the kitchen and get something. But you know, Before we come together, I invite you just to take a time to reflect that So often, Good Friday and Easter and some of these other services can, we just get wrapped up in the tradition of it. We get wrapped up in the, you know, we, the the obligation of, of worship sometimes, and this should not be that. So I invite us to reflect. We read some really heavy scriptures tonight. Take a minute to invite that to soak in. Reflect on the cross itself. Maybe you're even looking around your house right now and you can see two or three crosses. What do those mean to you? Why do you have them up? How does that represent what Christ has done for you? How does that represent the most beautiful thing ever, God's love for us? I invite us to spend a moment in silent reflection before we come to the table together. Let's do that. Church family, Christ our Savior and Lord invites to his table everyone who loves him, who earnestly repents of their sin and seeks to live in peace with one another. So before we come to the table of grace this evening, let's confess our sin before God and before one another. Let's pray this together. The word should be on the screen. Pray this with me out loud with your families at home. Merciful God, We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. 
We have often failed to be an obedient church. We have not always lived as citizens of your kingdom. At times we have chosen the darkness over living in your light. At times we have rebelled against your love. We have not always loved our neighbors and we have not always heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray, and free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Church, hear the good news. Christ was born to save sinful people like me and like you. And Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, while he knew we were sinners. That proves God's love toward us. He went to the cross knowing my sin, knowing your sin, knowing those thoughts, those words, those actions, those habits, all those things that we want to rid ourselves of. Jesus knows it, and he knew it. And he went to the cross for us. But in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. All the glory belongs to God because of that. I invite you to join me in in holding up the bread and holding up the cup this evening as you are worshiping at home. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took some bread He gave thanks to God for it, and he broke the bread. He then passed it amongst his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks to God for it, and he passed it amongst his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so it is in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, that we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. So God, I pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us in this church, in our homes, watching in our car, watching on a TV, doesn't matter where we are, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit because you are not restricted by anything. Pour your Holy Spirit on us and change us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this gift of bread and of juice. Lord, make this be in some mysterious way the presence of Christ among us, your body and blood, so that we might be for the world the body of Christ so that the world might see in your church what Jesus is all about. So Lord, use this sacrament for your glory. Use this sacrament to bless us and to change us and to draw us closer to you, we pray. All of this we pray in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I invite you now, as you are worshiping with your families, to take a minute to partake. Don't rush through it. Take some time. This is the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. This isn't just a a past truth that we memorialize. This is an eternal truth that we hold on to, that Jesus gave up everything for us. So let's take a minute to partake of the table this evening.
Savior say strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Lord now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, and he washed it white as snow. And when the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all and all to him I to set us out this evening from with a Ro- reading from Romans chapter 5. I'm going to be reading verses 6 through 8. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says this, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. 
while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ gave up everything for us. So Lord, we build our, our lives on this truth, on this gospel. That you love us enough to give up everything. That you gave your life to save sinners like us. Lord, may we respond well. May we not cling to our past lives anymore, but live for your righteousness that you enable in us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us freedom. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this blessing of life in you. And we cannot wait to celebrate in a couple of days on Easter Sunday morning. Lord, thank you for giving up everything. Thank you for the cross, Lord. We pray that you are glorified by the continued worship of your church and your disciples. All this we pray in Jesus' holy name. And all around Chautauqua County and maybe beyond, all God's people said, amen. Amen. Have a fantastic night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We will hopefully see you joining us here on Easter Sunday at 1030. Have a good weekend. Love you guys.